Hi, you're a human. You want to move faster than your legs, smoother than your bike, and definitely without sweating. But there's a problem. Your body runs on sandwiches, a car runs on explosions, so we built machines to turn stored energy into motion. That's automotive mechanics, the study of how we convince metal to move us around without complaining. Every car from a 1920s Ford to a 2025 Tesla is basically a translator. It converts energy into motion. That's it. It seems simple, but the process? Not so simple. You see, energy is the ability to do work, to move something against resistance. In cars, that energy can be chemical fuel, electrical batteries, or even a mix of both. When that energy gets used to create motion, it's called work. And the rate at which work happens? That's power. So when someone says their car makes 400 horsepower, it means it's capable of doing a lot of work, very quickly, or wasting a lot of fuel, also very quickly. Now, there's another keyword, torque. Torque is rotational force, the twisting power that actually moves the wheels. If horsepower tells you how fast the job gets done, torque tells you how strong the worker is. Torque moves the car off the line, horsepower keeps it flying down the highway. That's why trucks brag about torque and supercars brag about horsepower. One's built for hauling, the other for howling. But to create that power, you need a source of energy, something you can store, control and unleash when needed. Gasoline carries a ridiculous amount of energy per litre, around 34 megajoules. That's about the energy of 9,000 food calories. You could technically run your car on peanut butter if you could make it explode in perfect rhythm. Please don't. But energy alone isn't enough. You need a machine to convert it into motion efficiently. That's what engines and later electric motors do. They're middlemen between raw energy and useful motion. And like all middlemen, they lose a bit in the process. Internal combustion engines waste around 60 to 70% of their fuel energy as heat. Electric motors, on the other hand, convert over 85 to 90% into motion. That's why EVs feel instant, almost rude, when you step on the pedal. Now, interestingly, for over a century, the engine has been the beating heart of nearly every car, truck, and motorcycle on Earth. It's loud, hot, complicated, and somehow still beautiful. So what actually happens inside that block of metal? Controlled explosions, thousands of them, every single minute. The engine burns a mix of air and fuel inside a chamber, and those mini explosions push pistons down. The valves open and close like bouncers controlling air and exhaust. The camshaft tells those valves when to move. Then the crankshaft takes the up and down chaos and turns it into circular motion. The timing belt or chain keeps everything in rhythm. One tooth off, and your engine turns into modern art and all of it happens in precise coordination, managed by the ECU, engine control unit, a computer that monitors sensors, adjusts fuel and spark timing and makes sure your engine doesn't blow itself up. It's the brain keeping the fire under control. Most modern engines run on the four-stroke cycle, a sequence so efficient it hasn't changed much since the 1800s. Intake, the piston moves down, sucking in air and fuel. Compression, it moves back up, squeezing the mix tight. Power, the spark plug ignites it, boom, the piston slams down, exhaust, it moves up again, pushing burnt gases out. And before you can blink, it's already doing it again, thousands of times per minute, perfectly synchronized across cylinders. That's what your car calls idle. There are two main flavors of this chaos, petrol, gasoline, and diesel. Petrol engines use a spark plug to ignite the fuel air mix, controlled, precise, like lighting a match. Diesel engines skip the spark, they rely on compression ignition, squeezing air so tightly it gets hot enough to set the injected fuel on fire. The result? More torque, more noise and more soot. Basically, the strong, messy cousin of the petrol engine. Now, engines also come in different configurations, inline, V-shaped, flat, rotary, each with its own balance of smoothness, weight and vibration. A V8 sounds like thunder, an inline 4 sounds like anxiety, and a rotary sounds like it's begging for mercy. Yet the physics is identical. Air, fuel, compression, combustion, exhaust. Repeat. Efficiency? Not great. A typical gasoline engine converts only about 30 to 35% of the fuel's energy into motion. The rest becomes heat, noise, and regret. That's why you need cooling and lubrication systems to stop all that energy from melting metal. Let's start with lubrication, the unsung hero that keeps all those moving parts from eating each other alive. 
Inside every engine, there's a thin film of oil separating surfaces that would otherwise weld together from friction. That's not an exaggeration. Without oil, an engine can seize in under a minute. The process begins in the oil pan or sump, a small reservoir at the bottom of the engine. From there, the oil pump sucks up the fluid and pushes it through a network of galleries, tiny internal highways that deliver oil to critical parts like bearings, pistons, camshafts, and valve trains. Before it circulates, it passes through an oil filter which traps metal shavings, carbon, and anything else trying to turn your engine into sandpaper. Once it's made its round, gravity pulls the oil back down into the pan, ready to repeat the trip thousands of times per minute. That thin layer of oil does more than just lubricate. It also helps seal the gap between the piston rings and cylinder walls, improves cooling by carrying away heat, and even reduces noise by cushioning impacts between parts. Basically, engine oil is like a therapist, keeps everyone from fighting and burns out quietly in the process. But oil alone can't handle the firestorm. For that, you need a dedicated cooling system, the car's built-in climate control for metal, as combustion heats the cylinders, coolant, a mix of water and antifreeze, circulates through passages in the engine block and head, absorbing heat. It's pumped by the water pump toward the radiator, where it releases that heat to the outside air before looping back again. Think of it as a constant relay race. Coolant runs through the engine, gets hot, hands off the heat to the radiator, cools down and sprints back in. The radiator itself is a maze of thin tubes and fins designed for maximum surface area. As air flows through, either from driving or an electric fan, it pulls heat away. The thermostat manages the temperature, keeping it around 90 degrees Celsius for optimal performance. Too cold and fuel doesn't vaporize properly. Too hot and the engine starts cooking itself. The thermostat opens and closes like a gatekeeper, allowing coolant to flow only when needed. Of course, heat doesn't just stay in one place. Some engines use oil coolers or secondary radiators for extra control, and modern systems are pressurized, usually around one bar, so the boiling point of coolant rises, preventing vapor bubbles that could ruin circulation. In short, your car is basically a rolling chemistry lab designed to keep fire under control with fluid dynamics. Even electric vehicles, though they lack combustion, still need cooling for their batteries, motors, and power electronics. The principle is the same. Keep temperatures stable because heat kills efficiency, whether it's gasoline or gigawatts. But now that the engine can breathe, burn, and stay alive, there's still one more thing it needs to do. Exhale. Because all that combustion produces waste, and the way your car gets rid of it says a lot about how clean or loud it really is. You see, inside each cylinder, every explosion produces carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water vapor, and a cocktail of less charming byproducts like carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, and nitrogen oxides. None of that can just hang around, so once the exhaust valve opens, the gases blast out through a network of pipes called the exhaust manifold. Think of it as the car's first exhale, straight from the lungs. The manifold collects gases from all the cylinders and funnels them into one main pipe. In high-performance engines, this setup can be tuned so the pressure waves from one cylinder help pull gases out of the next, a trick called scavenging. It's why headers in sports cars look like tangled spaghetti. Every twist and curve is calculated for timing and flow. But raw exhaust is toxic, so before it leaves the car, it gets scrubbed by a catalytic converter, a small metal can packed with precious metals like platinum, palladium, and rhodium. Inside, chemical reactions turn poisonous gases into slightly less awful ones. Carbon monoxide becomes carbon dioxide, hydrocarbons turn into water and carbon dioxide, and nitrogen oxide split back into harmless nitrogen and oxygen. It's chemistry doing damage control, the unsung hero of modern emissions control. After the catalytic converter, the gases still have energy and sound, lots of it. That's where the muffler steps in. It's an acoustic labyrinth, inside are chambers, baffles, and perforated tubes that reflect and cancel sound waves. The result, your car hums instead of howls. Or if you're into that sort of thing, you replace the muffler with a straight pipe and make your neighbors hate you. There's also a resonator, sometimes placed before or after the muffler, fine-tuning the exhaust tone by cancelling specific frequencies. Together, the muffler and resonator make the difference between a smooth growl and a high-pitched headache. Meanwhile, sensors along the exhaust system constantly monitor what's going on. The oxygen sensors tell the ECU how rich or lean the combustion was, allowing the fuel mixture to adjust in real time. It's a feedback loop that keeps the engine running cleanly and efficiently. 
In newer cars, there can be multiple sensors before and after the catalytic converter to make sure everything's working as it should. The gases then travel the final stretch through the tailpipe, where they exit at around 100 to 200 degrees Celsius, often carrying traces of unburned fuel, moisture, and carbon soot. That white puff you see on a cold morning? It's mostly water vapor condensing in the chilly air. If it's blue, you're burning oil. If it's black, you're burning money. Modern systems are more advanced than ever. Performance cars use active exhaust valves that open or close depending on throttle input, balancing sound, and efficiency. Hybrids and EVS, on the other hand, don't even have exhaust systems, they don't burn anything, which means no tailpipe, no emissions, and sadly, no growl. Now that your car can breathe in and breathe out, it's time to talk about how that power actually moves to the wheels, because explosions alone won't get you anywhere, unless you plan to drive straight up. Undeniably, engines are powerful, but they're also needy. They spin fast, too fast, and not always at the right speed. If you connected your engine directly to the wheels, it'd either stall, explode, or both. That's where the transmission comes in. It's the car's translator, the system that takes the engine's chaotic power and turns it into smooth, usable motion. Think of it like this. The engine's crankshaft is a hyperactive kid who only knows how to spin fast. The wheels, meanwhile, are calm adults who just want a steady pace. The transmission's job is to keep them in sync, to convert high-rev chaos into controlled movement. It all starts with the clutch, or torque converter in the automatics. When you press the clutch pedal, you're separating the engine from the transmission, like hitting mute on a conversation before shifting gears. In manual cars, the clutch uses friction plates to engage or disengage the engine's power. In automatics, the torque converter does the same thing hydraulically, using fluid dynamics instead of direct contact. It's smooth, silent, and just a little bit magic. Once the engine's power reaches the transmission, gears take over. A gear is simply a wheel with teeth that changes torque and speed depending on size. Small gear driving big gear equals more torque, less speed, Big gear driving small gear equals more speed, less torque. That's the eternal trade-off in mechanics, strength versus speed. Every time you shift, you're choosing between the two. In a manual gearbox, you physically select which gears mesh together using a lever, a direct mechanical conversation between driver and drivetrain. In an automatic transmission, hydraulic pressure and planetary gear sets do the work for you. A planetary gear set sounds like NASA tech, but it's just a clever setup with a central sun gear, orbiting planet gears, and an outer ring gear. Depending on which part is locked or driven, you get different gear ratios. It's compact, efficient, and incredibly complex, like a fidget spinner with a PhD. Now, modern automatics use mechatronics, a blend of hydraulics and computer control, to shift seamlessly. Dual clutch systems go further, pre-selecting the next gear before you even finish the current one. That's how cars like the Porsche 911 or Audi R8 shift faster than you can blink. Meanwhile, CVTS, continuously variable transmissions, ditch traditional gears entirely, using pulleys and belts to provide infinite ratios between slow and fast. It's like having a dimmer switch for acceleration instead of an on and off button. Every transmission has one goal, keep the engine in its power band, the RPM range where it's happiest and most efficient, too low and it struggles, too high and it screams for mercy. The gearbox constantly balances that sweet spot, ensuring you're not wasting fuel or frying components. After the gears, power travels through the drive shaft, a rotating tube that delivers torque to the differential. The differential's job is to let the wheels spin at different speeds, crucial when turning. Without it, every corner would feel like dragging one tire through glue. But of course, not all cars send the power the same way. Some push it through the rear wheels, rear wheel drive, others pull it with the front, front wheel drive, and some send it everywhere at once, all wheel drive and four wheel drive. Each system changes how the transmission connects and how the car behaves on the road. But in every case, the goal remains the same channel power efficiently, predictably, and as smoothly as possible. But sending power is just half the battle. Once that energy reaches the wheels, the road starts fighting back. Bumps, dips, potholes, and corners. That's why your car needs a system that keeps your car from shaking itself to pieces, the suspension system. You also need a steering system, a braking system, and to know how the electronics in the car work. If this video gets over 1,000 likes, I will surely do a part two on that. Please subscribe.